Hello, and welcome to the latest edition of Screen Daily Talks, our live discussion series of hot topics affecting the global film industry. I'm Jeremy Kay, America's editor of Screen International. This webinar is sponsored by the St. Pete Clearwater Film Commission in Florida. As we approach the end of the year like none other, we're talking to four film industry professionals today who'll give us an overview of the independent film business on the eve of AFM 2020 online. Among other things, our panelists will be discussing the ongoing impact of the pandemic, look at the challenges of getting back into production in a COVID safe way, and talk about what role the AFM plays going forward in the life cycle of a film. First, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we'll have a discussion with our panelists before we open it up to questions from you, our live audience. If you have a question, please use the Q&A channel rather than the chat room, which our online editor, Orlando Parfit, will be monitoring and we'll get to as many as we can. Now let's say hi to our panelists. Tony Armour is the film commissioner of St. Pete Clearwater in Florida. Notable productions in the area include the Dolphin Tail franchise, Spring Breakers and The Infiltrator. Armour has directed features such as Portrait of a Superhero and Running with Demons and is founder of the Sunscreen Film Festival. Tony, welcome. Thank you. Mimi Steinbauer is founder and president of Los Angeles-based sales agents, Radiant Films International, and brings vast experience from the sales space. Steinbauer is currently setting Unplugging, a digital detox comedy with Eva Longoria and Matt Walsh. And her sales credits and her slate includes Delia's Gone with Stefan James and Marissa Tomei, an Ashley Green thriller aftermath. Hi, Mimi, welcome. Hi. Brian Beckman is Chief Financial Officer of Arclight Films, the sales production and finance company with deep ties to the US and Australia and the Asia Pacific region. Brian oversees all legal, financial and accounting functions of the company and has spearheaded financing on more than $150 million in productions. As a producer himself, his credits include Paul Schrader's action thriller Dog Eat Dog with Nick Cage. Brian, good to see you, welcome. Thanks, Jeremy, it's a pleasure to be here. Good to have you, good to have you all. And we're going to be joined shortly by Kim Sherman, who is the US-based producer and recently wrapped production on Ted Bundy thriller, No Man of God, starring Elijah Wood, which XYZ Films launched sales for at the uh, Cannes Virtual Market earlier this year. Kim's credits include the home invasion thriller, You're Next, as well as South by Southwest selections, Wild Canaries and Sun Don't Shine. So thanks for joining us, everybody. We're gonna have a really interesting panel here and um, let's get into it. Uh, really wanna start with an overview, uh, really from any of you, if you want to talk to these points, just to give people um, uh, an idea of when production uh, resumed in the US. Um, and we'll try and get an idea of how many might be up and running and what guidelines have to be satisfied with the guilds, the Screen Actors Guild, local authorities and the unions. So, can we just talk a little bit about that? When, in, in each of your opinions and what you know, what you've been involved with, when, when did productions resume after the lockdown earlier this year? Well, I guess I could speak a little bit to when they resumed here in Florida. And sometime over the summer, you know, projects started to kind of trickle in in June and July, August, and then really September, October, and now this month, November, have picked up dramatically. We actually have a lot of production happening here. Uh, not a lot of feature film production right now. We're looking at uh, a handful of features that would be, you know, in that one million to sub one million dollar range. But a lot of commercial production, digital projects, things that are smaller crew sizes, so don't necessarily require the same kind of, you know, processes that you would have uh, on a full union feature or something like that, which obviously, you know, becomes a little more complicated than in all the things that you have to do. Yeah, I would echo what Tony is saying, and that is that uh, there have been many states that have opened up uh, filming and uh, with the requirements to be able to film inside those uh, particular states and provinces and cities and whatnot, which has been great. But there's been a number of hurdles that have that prevented independent filmmaking from really kind of getting off the ground, such as whether it be COVID insurance, bond company requirements, financiers, and everybody still remains extremely jittery as to where the industry is going to go. Um, but the one area that I've seen, in, is specifically in the US, is those projects that Tony mentioned that are like sub a million dollars, where you're seeing a lot of, of smaller productions that are funded solely off of equity. 
They have a lot more flexibility. They could kind of get in. They could get talent on the ground without having to go through, um, you know, some of the uh, some of the, the more stringent requirements that the unions have, that SAG has, and things like that. Going up a little bit bigger than that, you start running into, you know, having to comply and have procedures and whatnot in that COVID arena where it really increases the, the cost of the overall budget. So what we've seen is, um, you know, some of those big studio projects that are, are having a, a number of problems, such as Batman, um, and then a lot of those smaller sub-million dollar projects that we've seen that can be a lot more flexible in between there. I have, I've really seen not much of anything happening in that particular area. They're at, they're, they are happening, but um, I, you know, I haven't seen any real feasible uh, and realistic plans out there right now. Overseas, very different story, but we can get to that later. Yeah, sure. Maybe, did you want to add to this? Yeah, on our end, we had two films that were in post-production when everything shut down and that seemed to go pretty smoothly because obviously many could do a lot of that from home. Um, and then in new productions, we've had two projects that are in that middle range um, that, that Brian was talking about. So in the, in the four to eight range, um, one shooting in Canada and one shooting in Oklahoma. So, um, but they both started in October. So it's been a very recent development. And yes, each of them ran into the various issues that we've talked about along the way to starting in October. Um, but they're both going and knock on everything that there have been no, you know, COVID issues, et cetera. But they're both structured incredibly different uh, in terms of COVID compliance necessities because Canada versus Oklahoma um, and also their structure in terms of bonded or not bonded. Um, so things are happening, but it's been a real recent on, on our end, a really recent development. Yeah, thanks to all of you. And I wanted to just briefly get an idea from each of you about projects that are shooting in your area or that you're involved with. Mimi, you've mentioned two. The one in Oklahoma is Unplugging, which you're selling right. at AFN, yes? Yes, it is, yeah. And um, that's Matt Walsh and uh, Ava Longoria. Um, and it's a project that we um, have been involved in for about a year. Um, and so it's exciting to see that um, going now, really exciting. So, uh, but they're shooting and will be done uh, by the end of November. So um, that's moving right along. Um, I freak out every time there's a film set anywhere on the planet that shuts down because of COVID, but so far uh, we're good. It's just, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a heightened awareness and, 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 but they're following all sorts of really strict protocols. I know that. And so it seems to be working well um, and then the other one is in Canada, um, which is called Delia's Gone, and that is shooting north of Toronto. And um, same thing, different protocols, but you know, really, really tight, tight restrictions on what they can and can't do. Um, and that'll be done by the end of November as well. So both of those are shooting, and we're excited because we're able to sell actual films at AFM, which is really nice because the, the sort of pie in the sky and I, we all do pre-sales, but you know, right now it's like, I think the buyers are uncertain about what is actually gonna start feasibly this year. Um, so it's nice to be able to say, these are two real films. We have stills to show you, uh, no, no promos yet, but you know, they're real and they're shooting. So that's, a, it's a, I feel like we're lucky to be in that position. Um, yeah, and then the next one we have starting is shooting in New Zealand. And that feels like a very different scenario um, just because obviously they have they have you sort of mastered the, the COVID issue at the moment. Um, yeah. So that one feels like it could be real as well. But most exciting is to actually have two shooting right now. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Mimi. Maybe we can yeah. come back to the New Zealand one. And I just want to welcome Kim Sherman, who's joined us. Hi, Kim. Thanks for joining. Hi, apologies for being so late. <laughs> Not at all. It's great to see you. And we introduced you with our other guests earlier. So the audience knows a little bit about you. Um, and that might be a great time if you could just briefly tell us, we, we've, I've asked um, our panelists to talk a little bit about uh, giving us an overview of production in the US. And you recently wrapped on No Man of God. Could you tell us a little bit about that and where that shot and what that is? Yeah, um, I'm uh, working as a producer with Spectre Vision. Um, it's uh, uh, Lisa Whalen, Elijah Wood and Daniel Noah's um, production, uh, genre production banner. Um, and we, we did shoot No Man of God, directed by Amber Seeley. 
in Los Angeles uh, this this summer. We we were shut down earlier uh, in the year. We were set to go in March, um, and of course shut down um, as did all of production in Los Angeles, and picked things back up when it seemed like there was more. Uh, knowledge of what of what we needed to do to take care of people and a process in place with unions. Um, and we were able to move forward with a 16 day, very small shoot, um, very few locations, very little cast, um, and we kept everyone safe. Um, we were able to, you know, get a lot of buy-in from cast and crew of what we needed to do as a community to keep everyone safe. And we made it through the production um, without anyone getting sick um, and uh, and pretty seamlessly. Um, I would say, I think we were, you know, very hesitant about what production would lo look like with all of the, the things you have to do now, the layers you add to, to make sure that people are safe and, and feel safe. Um, and, uh, and we were also able to pull a few productions through posts, like Mimi was saying, you know, post-production continued on some of our other projects as we went um, during the, the, the front end of the pandemic. Thanks, Kim. And I'd like to come back to talk to you more about the protocols and to each of you a little later. Um, and as we just go, go down and speak to everybody about their productions, Tony, can you give us a, a little bit more detail about what's been happening in St. Pete, Clearwater, what might be shooting in the area, what's recently shot or what's coming up? Yeah, like I said, you know, for us right now, you know, typically we permit over 250 projects a year. And of that, it's usually you know, 10 to a dozen feature films. It could be anything from, a, you know, really in Florida right now and in our area, it makes sense if they're 2 million and under because of the lack of a state, you know, tax incentive, but we do have a, a, a cash rebate here locally. So that 2 million under is what kind of makes sense. So there were a number of larger projects scheduled to come here this year, but all have been pushed to 2021 and you don't know when in 2021, but the, like I said, the commercial digital industry, digital content industry, music videos, short films, all that kind of stuff is kind of really going, you know, full bore right now. And, you know, the difference being on smaller projects like that, since they're non-union typically, you know, they, they do have COVID supervisors on set and they're following a lot of safety precautions, but they don't have the testing that, uh, that you would on the larger projects. So that makes them, you know, more reasonable cost-wise to shoot because that's the, one of the biggest expenses, if not the biggest expense, you know, when you're making a project and you, and you have to follow those testing requirements. But we do have uh, a couple, maybe three features that looks like they'll be shooting in the beginning of the year, anyway from, anywhere from January to March. And because the weather is still sunny and warm and beautiful in Florida, everyone can be outside still. So it makes a big difference to be able to shoot these productions outside in what is winter for everybody, everybody else. And those again are in that, you know, 1.2 million to 500,000 dollar range. And so it'll be a mixture of, uh, and Florida is what's known as a right to work state. So you don't have to use unions if you don't want to, basically, as far as crew goes. So you'll have some productions that'll have unions or a combination of union and non-union or, you know, smaller ones, and you know, no union at all. But again, uh, one of the things my office always does is uh, refer and make sure that they have COVID supervisors on set to make sure that they are following all those procedures and doing everything they need to so that we can keep production going in the area. Yeah. And Tony, how has the commission changed its marketing approach during the pandemic, if at all? What have you adapted? <laughs> well, I've been home a lot, that's for sure. You know, uh, normally I would have been at uh, AFM and uh, at Produced By in LA over the summer and other trips to LA and, you know, just kind of all over the place. So now it's, you know, with the virtual conferences, to be honest with you, for me, I don't get a lot of value from a virtual, from a virtual conference. Um, I can do the same thing with Zoom meetings like this or phone calls or emails or, or whatever else. So I haven't really been doing the virtual conferences. We've just been, uh, you know, spending our marketing dollars in, in other ways or saving them for when we can, you know, get to do something uh, a little bigger and kind of, you know, get out of the house, so to speak. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to all of you. Um, now, I just, we're going to get onto sales a little bit later and we'll also talk about the AFM and, and Tony's touched on that already, but I uh, just want to dive in a little bit more into the actual nuts and bolts of production um, and, you know, the protocols, what, you, what you've been learning and, and what has had to change and be brought in um, to these productions. I think our audience would be very interested in that. Brian, did you want to touch on uh, some of the films that Arclight is involved with now and the whole business of getting it back, getting up in, in, a, in a, a COVID safe way during this pandemic? 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, well, we have found that there are certain territories that have been um, extremely friendly uh, to the filmmakers. One of them is in our backyard, which is Australia. And we've got a production that is just starting this week that we're very excited about. Uh, more to follow uh, at the beginning of AFM on that project. I'm super excited about that. We've got another project that's opening up in the in Q1 that we're gearing up for. And then we've got our epic shark movie that we've got coming in Q2, all in Australia. So we found Australia with uh, the government being, uh, uh, you know, so flexible and understanding of the situation and their willingness to underwrite COVID insurance in Australia has been a massive support to the actual independent film industry there. Uh, similar things have been doing and uh, been done in the UK. We just finished post on a film in the UK, which will be released in Q1 and it's called Twist. And uh, we did have a little bit of COVID issues with that during the post because it had Michael Caine in it. And, you know, getting him to do ADR during a COVID environment was rather tricky. And, you know, we wanted to make sure that obviously the, all the casts are safe and they're well taken care of. So, you know, we were trying to, you know, there's a lot of COVID requirements and procedures that occur on set. But there's also those underlooked uh, COVID requirements that are in the post arena as well. So, um, but we finished up a post on that and that'll be released in Q1. And then we also finished up post on our Brandon Cronenberg film uh, called Possessor, which uh, a big shout out to Neon and Wellgo because they just released that theatrically at the beginning of October. It's done very well and we've been very impressed and happy with that. And uh, but uh, yeah, Doris and Tom over at, well, at Wilgo and, uh, and Neon, re uh, respectfully, uh, did a great job. This is one of those periods of time where independent films that actually are of a, of a certain quality level actually have a shot of being able to be theatrically released. And it's because so many of the other big studio films have been pushed. It's given other uh, independent films that opportunity to kind of get in there. And we had a film that just released at the very beginning of the COVID uh, uh, you know, pandemic called Escape from Pretoria with Daniel Radcliffe. And surprisingly enough, it did very, very well during the pandemic because it was a finished and completed film, all ready to go. When theaters started to open back up around the globe, it was one of the first that wasn't pushed uh, you know, to, a different, uh, to a different year. And many of the distributors just threw it out in the, uh, uh, in the theaters. And, did a fantastic job and we're very happy with that. But uh, yeah, we've got a lot of, uh, you know, we've been looking throughout the entire globe at different areas, whether it be UK, Canada, and uh, Australia have been where we have found the most friendly to work with uh, the, the different restraints that we have. It, obviously there's other problems such as quarantine and things like that that we have to deal with, but um, you know, it seems to be uh, you know, more friendly with the COVID insurance, the bonds and the financiers. Um, uh, in that medium range type of market that, that, uh, that Arclight plays in. So that's, that's kind of where we are. Yeah, thanks Brian. Kim, I just wanted to come back to you if you can talk to us a little bit about, uh, say, Ma No Man of God, which you said had been shut down earlier this year and then you got it back up. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, we, were, we were in our last week of prep when, um, when production in general was shut down and, and so no one could go into production. <laughs> So our plan kind of shifted. We and it was easy enough for us to, at the point we were at, kind of um, keep things on on a simmer um, while while things uh, um, developed on the scientific side of of what's happening with COVID and and then with the unions and and um, the different stakeholders that need to figure out how to keep people safe. And, and uh, we picked back up in um, September. Um, and shot in oh, across September and October um, without really missing a step too much. Um, it, you know, there was definitely uh, a little bit of added time to figure out what, um, how to form the team, the health and safety team that we needed to um, make sure that there was, there was a dedicated team to the practices on the ground that we needed to keep everyone safe. Um, and then beyond that, it was um, adjusting locations and um, kind of fitting things to, to uh, uh, safe ventilation, safe procedural manner. Um, but it, we had such a great team. Um, our, you know, our, our cast and crew were all uh, really willing to to do what they needed to to um, to uh, 
uh, hold the highest standard of safety, um, which in the end allowed us to kind of take, put COVID to the back of our minds and make the best creative uh, endeavor um, as a team too, because we we trusted everyone that was there to to do exactly what they needed to to keep everyone safe. Of course, of course, and congratulations on that. And uh, when did when did it shut down? Was this in spring? Yeah, this was in March. So we were. Uh, we were a week away, um, the Lakers shut down and then we did. <laughs> so yeah, we just, we kind of followed suit. <laughs> yeah. And can you give us a little bit more detail about the protocols? I mean, I'll ask this of uh, Mimi and our other guests too, but we're talking temperature tests, uh, test zones, what kinds of things? Yeah, so I, I would say that we were one of the earlier productions to go in Los Angeles, um, and so we we uh, we followed what was at the time the, the the white papers that went out that were the the bare bones of what needed to happen for productions to to get off the ground, and they've since um, definitely developed a, a more stringent um, protocol system. Um, and there were there were it was just at the beginning of health and safety, um, you know dedicated health and safety officers um, for production as well. Um, so for us, we, we sort of just um, followed, we had a really great um, health and safety supervisor named William Roche, whose background is actually in healthcare. Um, he was in charge of um, more of an engineering and health, health science brain where um, his, his, uh, his background was in sterile environments and keeping places sterile and free from germs. Um, and so that was perfect for our set. So it started with, you know, a ventilation plan of what we needed to do to air out spaces where we knew people would be acting without masks and working um, in close proximity with one another and making sure that we were, you know, um, we had multiple exits, um, multiple ventilation paths. Um, and then there we had everything from a pretty, uh, uh, a regular testing pattern. Um, we had two zones because we were a really small production. Um, we had the people who were in the nucleus of the production, which is the set and in the in the area which would become the red zone at times when people didn't have masks and yellow zone when it was, you know, ventilated and you still had to have full PPE on. Um, but we had we had masks readily available for everyone. We had check-in systems every day. We used an app on our production to both um, monitor um, testing and COVID, um, COVID, you know, danger assessment and um, as well as ordering lunch. I mean, it was, it was great. I mean, things just, while we were going, things just kind of caught up um, technology wise and procedure wise. Um, but we, we did a pretty stringent like testing, um, testing path. Um, we, we took temperatures every day, um, the quiz every day. Um, we had uh, drive-in testing in, during prep um, and kept our offices remote. Um, and then when we came together on set, we had the check-in system and then we had um, health and safety officers on set, just making sure people were reminded of the rules in times when you were working very quickly and maybe forgot um, the distance rules and the, the, the proper way to use PPE. So we were, we were monitoring a lot. It was, it was um, a, a whole de new department and, and all the things that came with it. Yeah, but as you say, if it's well handled, it almost goes to the background and you can get on with the job of producing and making the film. Yeah, the first two days felt, you know, the first day especially felt the slowest because of, you know, check-in, but even then our team just felt like ready to go. Um, and then after that, the check-in system was a breeze and um, people really did. I mean, for us, the pride came from people not getting sick and from people saying, you know, just watching the quality of work that was coming from people and knowing that they did feel safe and that they were able to kind of forget about it for a minute at work and, and get their jobs done. Yeah, yeah, that's good to hear. Um, I want to just touch on insurance. Um, Brian, you've mentioned that with uh, the Australian government, uh, you know, underwriting uh, to some extent and, and being a great help there. But in the United States, there's no federal backstop as there's a, there is a, this program in the UK in Australia Canada um, so what's the situation with uh, with getting insurance can you just give us a little overview um, Tony Brian uh, Mimi Kim uh, if you had insurance in place before the pandemic spread and the lockdown came down came into effect that would still be good to go if your production was taking place later in the year yes would you be covered? for COVID if you had insurance in place before the pandemic uh, began? Uh, Brian, do you have anything to say? Or Kim, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I could jump in here. And that is that uh, from my point of view, it has been immensely discouraging. 
it has been one of the hurdles that has probably prevented a great deal of, of our films from getting off the ground. Um, there is wild and crazy insurance project, products that are out there, but they're just so cost prohibitive that it, it just doesn't make sense for an independent film. Um, but I've heard horror stories of films that, um, that have been shut down because of uh, situations, whether it's been in the US or globally. And there's just no way that they're going to be able to, you know, effectively, cost effectively get back off the ground again. It is, uh, it's, it's really discouraging. Um, and it, you know, w with a lot of the brokers that I've spoken to recently, um, they continue to be extremely cautious and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, they're happy to bind, but without COVID. And so without that, then you have problems with the bond company. Without that, you have problems with the financier. So there might be great places like Tony has, you know, shooting in Florida is amazing. It's, it's an incredible area to shoot. I love being in Florida and shooting. Um, but, you know, it, I, you know, I can't shoot there if I can't get insurance. I can't get a bond. I can't get a financier. Uh, so those are a lot of limiting factors. So there's so many different things that go into it. And insurance is probably one of those key areas. That's why having it underwritten in Australia has really kind of opened, I don't want to say the floodgates, but has allowed a lot of productions to really start ramping up and getting into gear now. Uh, same thing with the UK and Canada as well. Yeah, thanks. I yeah. want to come to you, Tony, as well. But uh, Mimi, Tony, I'm coming right back to you. Mimi, could I just ask you, because you've got a couple of in production projects now that you're selling. What's the situation with insurance on those as far as you know? Um, the, um, as Brian was saying, the ones in Canada are insured and bonded um, in a tradition, fairly traditional way with, in, you know, that include COVID. Um, and in the US, uh, what we've been seeing for ours and also multiple of the producers and financiers that I've been talking to is that the financiers are taking the bond risk, uh, which is of course huge. Uh, I mean, a huge risk and a huge step in the right direction. It's huge in both ways, um, but it's really, really hard to get both the insurance and the bond um, without a giant COVID exclusion, which does nobody any good right now um, in the US right now. So it's a tough scenario. Um, and so I think you have to have financiers, um, producers, et cetera, that are, um, you know, that are, that are being incredibly creative uh, on yeah. how to manage that. Yeah. Yeah, and careful, as Kim was saying, to be able to follow all the protocols, et cetera, that you just do your very, very best um, to not put anybody at risk, um, at more risk than they naturally are, you know, during a pandemic. So um, it's, a, but it's, it's tough in the U.S. I agree with Brian that it's discouraging and a real hurdle at the moment. Yeah, and it's tough and it's a balancing act. Tony, I'm sorry I cut you off. Back to you. Yeah, no, no problem at all. I was really just going to echo what Brian and, and Mimi just said is, you know, getting production insurance is no problem. You know, you can get production insurance just like you normally would, but it won't cover anything for COVID. Uh, and, you know, depending on the budget of the project, you know, if it's that 1 million or under 2 million or under, a lot of times those projects aren't bonded, so you don't have to worry about the bond. Uh, but what you do have to do is, again, just like Kim described, make sure you're taking all of the precautions procedures to make sure that the, the set is safe so that you don't get shut down because that's that's the risk. And so it really depends on the appetite of the, uh, the financier on whether they believe in what the production has put together and think that they can you know, pull it off safely without uh, shutting down and chance of losing some money. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Kim, did you have something you wanted to say about that or else we'll move on to another talking point? No, it was covered very eloquently by everyone else, so I'm good. Good. So let's move on to um, the sales elements of all this right now. We've got AFM 2020 online is starting. Um, and you're all involved in these markets in one way or another with your product as film commissioners or sales agents. Um, Mimi, if I can just start with you. Um, let's talk about the impact of this and the, uh, the production halt on your buyers. You know, they're clamoring for content. Um, what are they saying to you and what are they looking for? Um, well, um, we were lucky um, in that we had five completed new films that we announced that were new and that we announced in Berlin. Um, and that was just whatever, the, the production gods were smiling on us in terms of timing. But we had, so we had five brand new completed films and there's been a good appetite for that, I have to say. Um, the, just because they know that they're real, they're done, they can screen them and um, they need product. 
Um, what I've been seeing sort of obviously back in March, April, May, we didn't know how long this was going to last. Um, and there was, they, the buyers were being very selective about what kind of completed films they were looking for. And then it sort of became clear that I think none of the films that they were expecting to shoot and have delivered in 2020 or even the first half of 2021 were coming. Um, and so then I think buyers started to look for films that were um, filling slots that they had, if they had already pre-sold something to a streamer or to a, a TV station that they were looking for something very specific, I'm making it up, but a female driven whatever, horror or whatever, that is, is um, a very specific film that they needed to find in order to keep that, that pre-sale that they had done on their end. Um, and now I feel like they're looking for product definitely, but they're limited in terms of what they can do with it on their end, because obviously many of my buyers are theatrical. Their business models are theatrical and it's, you know, week to week. We don't know, are they going to be able to exploit it theatrically? And if they can't right now, when? We don't know. Um, so that's affected what they're looking for. So I think they're looking for projects that they know that they can locally sell on to a digital um, to their pay TV or their free TV. Um, and obviously in many countries, they don't have the options we do on the streaming side. So it's like they, they know, can they sell it to their local Netflix? And if not, what do they do with it? So um, yes, they're looking for content, but it's also what are they gonna do with it locally? So it's, there's appetite, but I think it's, it's a very specific and very conscious risk assessment on their end in terms of what is that product that they're looking for that they can really exploit given, you know, given the unknowns that we have. And yeah, yeah just to kind of to elaborate on what Mimi was saying there, you, you did it so eloquently and I, I'm not sure if I could add any more to that except for muddle it up, but uh, essentially every territory is different. And there are some territories as Mimi was saying that are very theatrical based. They don't have the infrastructure, the streaming infrastructure that, that we have here in the US. U.S. has got a, a voracious appetite right now for streaming content, but that isn't the same thing in Russia or Eastern Europe or some of those other countries. And so everybody is still in a state of quasi unknown, especially with Europe now closing back down again. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of uncertainty that still remains in the market. Um, there are certain economic elements that are, are really going to start panning out starting next year, and that's going to be supply and demand. And that is that we've now had nine months with very few productions getting off the ground. That means that next year, even when the, the, the you know, uh, once we get a vaccine and once we can really start getting into full swing of production again, it's still going to be another 12 to 18 months before those products are done and completed. So you are going to run into a supply and demand issue in probably the first or second part of next year. And those producers that can actually get a product off the ground and turn it quicker than the typical 12 months and maybe in nine months or less, um, you're going to have a, an advantage over a lot of other producers that are having, you know, that 12 to 18 month incubation period, so to speak. Um, but Every territory right now is really kind of approaching in different ways. Um, yes, there is a lot of people that are looking for content right now. It, you just give me a completed film. ArcLight's been lucky. We've got 10 new projects. We're doing 10 screenings at AFM, and they're all completed films. We're excited about that. You know, some of them are of great quality. Um, then they run the gambit of everything from a genre to family feel-good movies. So we've been very, you know, we're very happy about that. Um, and then we've got... Uh, something that the, uh, we haven't seen since uh, really last year, and that is that buyers are now starting to really look at pre-sales and starting to look at those projects. What is coming up? How likely are they going to come up? Because a lot of people are pitching projects right now that, you know, that you just kind of, you already know in advance that you know, this is unlikely to start in January, just because of what we already know in the industry. So we see those all day long. Um, but those producers that have had that track record as Mimi and Kim have been talking about that are, they do know how to, to make their way through the minefield. It's those types of projects that people are going to be looking for because they know they can deliver. Um, so again, 
the distributors are, are kind of all over the place. They're looking for that product. They are starting to, be, they're just beginning to look at the pre-sales again. But again, to look at a pre-sale, they also want to see the talent. Talent is more important than anything um, right now. And they want to know that they're going to be able to see those and that they have a reliable production team behind it to get them off the ground. Yeah. So that, that's how I just muddled up everything eloquently Mimi just said. So uh, my no, I, I, agree, I agree completely with that. And I do think it comes back to, um, which I was thinking when Kim was so, so wonderfully explaining all the protocols, I think there's a level of, of comfort that everybody needs that we as sales agents need and also the buyers need with the producers and the production company right now, because um, you always care that your production is going to look good and be good. But now it's also, is it going to be safe? Are you going to be able to make it through? So I think who you're working with on the producer side is incredibly important. And the buyers, I think, look at that as well. It's like how, based on your sales company, and your producers, how realistic is this? Because yes, as Brian said, I don't know how many buyers called me up from all over the world and said, so there's this film that's supposed to start, it's an action film and it's gonna shoot in Jan in, you know, in LA in April. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> so it's really, it's a, it's a question of, you know, what's, what's realistic and do you trust, you know, do you trust that whoever is gonna be able to get it off the ground in a safe way? Um, so I think that adds to it. And then one other point is, and I think Brian spoke to this earlier, in all of these business models that we're looking at with the, with the cinemas closing, that adds a huge um, question mark to most uh, models of exploitation. But it does also allow, as Brian said, a few of our independent films to get wider releases than they would um, in, in pre-COVID times because the studios aren't putting anything out. And so it's, we have a film in Germany that Warner Brothers is bringing out and I think it's gonna be a wide release in Germany. Um, it's a German film, it's called Ein Nasser Hund. Um, and it's a film that would not have gotten, you know, many hundreds of screens in Germany uh, pre-COVID. But now because um, the studios aren't releasing anything, we have a wonderful opportunity with this gem of a film that we wouldn't otherwise. So I think everybody, all of our distributors have to be incredibly um, flexible, quick on their feet and, and just um, exploiting rights as they can. And it's really a week to week um, thing. It's, it's, I mean, hats off to everybody who's getting anything done right now. Yeah. And maybe just in a word or two, what's the genre of that German movie? Um, it's a story, it's an immigrant story about a, a, a gang member in Berlin um, who ultimately um, um, has to decide between, he's in a Muslim, a Muslim area, <coughs> and he has to decide whether he's going to hide his Jewish roots or um, let people know, and it's really a life or death situation for him. So it's a really, really moving story based on a true story. Excuse me. Um, and incredibly important right now. Yeah. Um, so okay. that's, that's that one. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's Mimi, that, we're gonna we're gonna have to ask you to put your mask on. It's that dry. <laughs> it's that dry <laughs> Illinois air. Um, Tony, I just want to. We're going to go to some audience questions in a few minutes. But Tony, from from your conversations with the filmmakers in St. Pete Clearwater and um, around the area, uh, you you know you've you, you're, you have experience with studio level productions, small indie productions, what's their confidence levels in terms of, say, with the, stu with the smaller productions, what, what, are they, what are they saying about finding distribution? Uh, what, what are their confidence levels? Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, I, I do things a little different than a lot of film commissions in that I do like to work directly with sales agents and distributors to basically relay the information to filmmakers, not just here in St. Pete Clearwater, but other areas around the country and the world to bring projects here on, you know, what they're looking for is like, I'll talk to a certain filmmaker and be like, hey, I know this particular, you know, company's looking for Christmas film. If you can get a Christmas film done sometime in the next nine months, I can put you together with them, you know, shoot it here and, you know, kind of work those sort of things to, you know, reverse engineer, um, you know, what does the market need and get the filmmakers to make what the, what the market needs with the goal of, of course, you know, shooting it here. So we've done that with a, with a number of projects locally. So, you know, what we're seeing is, and what I'm seeing are, are projects that are, you know, know what's, know what's wanted in the marketplace and trying to put those projects together now. And that's the example of the, the, the few that I talked about that are probably shoot that January, February, March timeframe here in, here in Florida. So, you know, really reverse engineering a little bit and seeing what we can do to help those filmmakers 
make movies that the, that the marketplace wants and is going to need, you know, moving forward. And so that's why it's always interesting to hear, you know, Mimi and, and Brian talk about, you know, the slots. All right, okay, we need, we had a family film here. We don't now. We need a family film to fill the slot for, you know, September or something like that. How quickly can we get something? And so that's was why I like to work directly with the filmmakers and the, and the sales companies to, you know, kind of facilitate a lot of that, essentially. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to some audience questions now. We've got quite a few coming in. And um, the first one is from Michael Fisk. And Michael asks this, he says, in the smaller budget films, say up to $1 million, roughly how much percentage increase um, do the COVID protocols uh, translate to? How much do pro COVID co protocols add to the budget of a film? And how much longer does it take to shoot the film? How much more time are you spending on production with all these protocols in place? Kim, I wonder if you'd like to uh, address that first. Yeah, I, I don't know about under a million, um, but I, I do know that the the we saw, we heard that it would be 25 to 35% of your budget marked up um, to, to accommodate um, the COVID compliance. Um, but then on top of that, there is the, as as Brian and Mimi were stating, it's, it's difficult to get insurance in the US. So if you are shooting in the US, you're also looking at a steeper contingency to cover any down days you might have if um, there's a you know even a positive or a false positive or some reason that you have to shut production down for any amount of time um, and so those are things to consider in building your budget but then um, as far as uh, time um, we had an amazing AD team <laughs> so I you know we were still shooting 11 pages a day um, but it depends on what the content of your 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 script is. I mean, if you like you said, if you have like an action, we we had two people in a room speaking to each other most of the time, so it was easy for us to set, ventilate, and um, and continue to film and stay in the moment and not lose too much. But if you do have a lot of locations or if you have a lot of casts, then you are looking at probably um, you know a, a smaller percentage of pages to, per day because of all of the you know when you move, anytime you move there's a lot more that you have to do to keep everyone safe and everything sanitized. So um, we're hearing on, on things that are a little bit more complicated that you're only getting one to two pages a day, but I can't speak to that personally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Kim, you're, you're absolutely right. I, 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 with all the budgeting that I've been doing over the last nine months, I completely agree with you that the cost increases are ranging between 25 to 30%. Again, it depends on where you're shooting. Um, in the U.S., that's on the average, um, and moving to you know Australia, I keep harping on Australia, but the cost is lower in Australia uh, to you know for those type of COVID requirements. Now we have our, our client has a huge COVID protocol and procedures manual that I had to put together, but nonetheless, it it it, it is there is a significant impact uh, on the cost of the film because of COVID. Yeah. Um, Mimi, did you want to address this? Oh, uh, we're hearing from our producers also 20% plus. Um, and again, I agree, like our, our film that's shooting in New Zealand, I haven't seen a marked increase in the budget, um, but we're, we're also not, we haven't started yet. So that might still come, but in the US we're seeing 20% plus and that's for that sort of mid range um, project. Um, so okay. I think it's, it's tough and depends again, as Kim said, on, on what, what are you doing on the set? Yeah, yeah, well, thanks for that. Um, I, I have another question now, which I'd like to ask Tony, and, and I'd like all of you to address this perhaps. Um, uh, it's anonymous, we don't know who's asking this question, but it's not too controversial. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is something you touched on earlier, Tony. What, if, what have been your experience of virtual markets and festivals and how much value do they bring to your business? Uh, well, like I said, for me personally, I don't get a lot out of out of a virtual market. You know, for someone like myself, whose job is to market and sell St. Pete Clearwater area and to, you know, bring people and bring productions here. You know, since I've been in the business for so long, I've, I've met a lot of people and I already know a lot of people. And so I can continue to make phone calls and emails. And so, you know, typically at a, at a regular market when you're there in person, you know, it's the shaking babies and kissing hands uh, kind of thing where you're just kind of meeting as many people as you can and introducing yourself and, you know, going to different functions and, and trying to, you know, the whole networking aspect of it. And I've found, again, just me personally, that the virtual markets uh, don't bring that value to me. And so I'm not really participating in them. Yeah. 
Um, and Brian and Mimi, I'd like to get your views. Brian, what do you think about these virtual markets we've had this year in the festivals? Well, I don't want to, I certainly don't want to speak for Mimi, but uh, uh, it has been, uh, um, it's a necessary evil. I don't think that uh, any of our team has particularly enjoyed doing virtual markets. Um, there's a, 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 there's been all kinds of studies about the effects of doing long-term Zoom meetings all day long and the impact that it has emotionally on people. And I'm trying to watch this as I'm trying to help, you know, build the tools for the rest of the cell team, but is not, um, you know, uh, uh, it's not a preferred method of really selling and getting the films out there. Um, what has happened that I, you know, I see that the, a longer ranging impact is that those time periods where um, everybody would go to a market to sell a film, those, bar those walls are, are, are disintegrating, meaning that people are now working every single day in between markets. And since Cannes, there's been literally, it's been Cannes, there's been Venice, there's been MIPCOM, there's been Toronto um, and Hong Kong Film Art, and now AFM all since June. And so there is certainly a fatigue that's going on and you're seeing a lot of the distributors now, not necessarily waiting for markets, but being you know, proactive in between those markets because they're overloaded. There is so much that is going on. It's taking the distributors a lot longer to process and consume and see what's going on. And I think that's just inherent with a virtual industry. Um, it's a lot different when you're face to face with somebody, when you can sit down with them for those two or three minutes and show them a promo, when you can have that interaction, you lose those types of personal touches in a virtual market. However, it's a necessary evil and we're all going through it. Um, and I think that we're all doing the best that we can. Mimi, maybe you got a different opinion about that, but, um, it's certainly all the work and none of the fun of waking up in the South of France or, Berlin or Toronto, so, but uh, it has certainly been, uh, yeah, a necessary evil. Mimi, a necessary evil, would you agree? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't hate them quite as much as Brian does, I have to say. I do agree that it's, you know, all of the, the wonderful part of, you know, I have dear, dear friends in the film business that are buyers um, that I love to see in the south of France or in Toronto. Um, um, but I think there's, it's, it's incredibly efficient and that's, you know, for better or for worse, it's efficient. So you get stuff done. Um, I think the buyers are, um, we're, we were all exhausted from traveling all the time. So I do think people are refreshed and focusing on stuff. Um, but it's not, it's not of the glitz and glamour, um, but I'm, I'm finding it not as horrible as I expected. I really, to quote Dorothy Parker, what fresh hell is this? That's what I thought it was going to be. And it's not as terrible as that, I have to say. Um, I'm doing a lot of, as Brian said, a lot of meetings, you know, Zoom meetings and calls between the markets, but I was doing calls between anyway. So, I mean, I think our, our, our sales world had sort of, you know, expanded anyway, because the markets are, you know, a certain time of year and when your production is ready or not has, has changed anyway. So um, I feel like it's, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's terrible. It's not as fun, of course, but I don't think it's as terrible. I do think the markets are helpful to focus everybody because we can, it can all get kind of vague of, you know, um, it's July and I'm sending you stuff. So I do think to have the markets gets everybody focused for a week or two on let's look at new products. So I feel like that's the driver behind the AFM and it was the same thing with virtual can uh, was let's get everybody organized and focused so that everybody is looking at stuff. Um, but I'm not... I'm meeting with the same buyers virtually that I would in, in, um, in real life. Um, I do feel like we're attending the Tokyo film market, which I would never go to, but it's like virtually, yes. So there's a couple of things like that where we've attended virtual markets that I probably wouldn't fly to unless we had a film in the festival. Um, so that's been kind of fun getting to know some new buyers that way. So I don't think it's as terrible as Brian was describing, but it's none of the it's none of the rosé on the Quasette and, and red car. And I mean, I love Toronto. Um, so, you know, I missed, deeply missed Toronto. Um, and we'll see how AFM goes. Yeah, exactly. And I just, we have another question here from somebody who's um, withholding their name, but they're saying, what impact do we think this uh, pandemic will have on the sales market and festivals next year? 
Do you think from what you know and what your gut is telling you that Berlin might happen in February? And if it does happen physically in some form, would you personally be attending? Would you be willing to fly over there? Mimi, why don't we stay with you? Yeah, from, from what I've heard, the market is going to be virtual in Berlin. I don't think it's been announced officially, but that's what everybody is telling me from Berlin is that the market is going to be virtual and that they're hoping to do the festival like Venice did uh, in real. And I think that's easier because you can drive there or you are local, et cetera. So I think the festival is, I understand that the festival is going to be real and the market is going to be virtual. Um, um, I, my family's in Austria, so I might combine it because I haven't been since Feb last February. So I might combine it and go if it felt safe. But I think if it was just to go to the market, um, no, because then I'd rather meet with the individual German buyers um, and they'd probably be the only ones that would be there um, or the surrounding countries. Um, and I also don't know that they would want us flying there from the US. You know, who knows what, you know, yeah. our numbers are going to look like in February. And I don't want to go in quarantine lovely as the mandala is in Berlin. I don't want to go quarantine there for two weeks before I can see somebody <laughs> and eat a curly boost. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Brian, Tony, would you go to Berlin? Would you ordinarily go there? Uh, Tony, if I uh, just come to you. Would yeah, you nor to normally I do, no, normally I do Berlin, but uh, obviously I'm not gonna go if it's not, uh, it's not really happening. It's just a virtual market. Um, you know, I'd be ready to hop on a plane and, and go somewhere if, you know, things were, if you didn't have to sit in a hotel for two weeks or, or whatever, but uh, you know, barring that, I'll be staying in Florida, I guess. Right, and Brian, what's your views on, on the Berlin of it all? Yeah, I think that uh, we're going to be looking at a 95% confidence level that uh, Berlin will not be happening or it will be happening in a virtual market, which will continue to always participate. Um, I have a fondness for Berlin, but, um, uh, you know, it's I, I just don't think it will have a physical market. The next physical market that I think we have a shot at will be can. I think uh, it won't be any sooner than that. Okay. And Kim, Do you want to I, speak? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jeremy. Go ahead, Mimi. Then I want to come to Kim and something. Yeah, no, I just wanted to speak to the festival part because I think to me, we have a lot of festival films. Um, and to me, that's the saddest of all of this and the most damaging because I think the festival films are films that you need to experience with an audience. That's just the joy of a festival film. Um, and that's really sad that, you know, that, that people are watching festival films in most cases at home on their, we hope at least on their desktop screen as opposed to on an iPhone somewhere. Um, because I just think it's such a different experience. And so that's the part that makes me sad all for, for sales professional reasons, but also for these films, um, is that I just think it's a different, it's it, to, to lose the festival world and the experience of seeing beautiful, delightful gems of films with other film people um, around the world is really, is to me is the saddest part of this whole pandemic. Yeah. Absolutely. In our business, not to inflate that, but you know what I mean, in our business. <laughs> of course, of course, of course, we take, we take your point. Um, Kim, I have a question here from Ernst Gossner, who says, I'm um, interested in hearing how the uh, pandemic is in regards to attaching US talent. Uh, they have a thriller, um, micro budget thriller that's going to shoot in Europe, halfway financed, and we're about to approach talent. What's the situation now? How does COVID change approaches of attaching talent? So Kim, in your day-to-day, -day, um, what, what's it been like drawing, uh, drawing talent to a project in this pandemic year? Is it, is it harder? Is it no problem at all? What's, what's going on? Um, no, it, it, it's definitely, the, the conversations change for sure. I mean, it depends on um, who, who you're trying to attach. Um, I know that um, in looking at the statistics and how people are being affected by COVID. Um, I think that um, older American actors are obviously being more careful. Um, and so those conversations are a little bit different. How, how much do they have to travel? Um, are they gonna have to quarantine? What are the precautions that, that, that production is actually taking to ensure that people are safe, especially older Americans? Um, and so for a lot of people, there is that added, um, that added weight when they are weighing the pros and cons of going back to work um, of if I get sick, it might be really bad for me. So I need to really consider that before I take a job. So so there, there's the added weight, but if a project is strong and the production is, is being safe, you, you, there's still a chance you'll draw talent. We were able to draw a lot of people to our production, which was a smaller production. Um, 
and you know it was a great script a great team uh, but we you know it was one of the things we considered was uh the, the makeup of our cast and and what we needed to do to be extra cautious yeah of course tony are you what are you seeing with regard to that question in your conversations uh, with talent and with uh, producers and filmmakers yeah you know like always it, it depends on the particular talent, like Kim said. And of course it depends on, depends on the money. Is the money real or not? Do you have the money or are you just trying to attach the talent because you're looking for the money? So, you know, I think uh, people want to work, uh, especially now, a lot of people lost jobs or haven't been able to work for a while. So it depends on the level of the talent. If it's talent that doesn't need to work, you know, that's, that's a little different, but I think a lot of actors uh, still would like a job and maybe there's some opportunities to get some talent you wouldn't normally be able to get. Uh, but it does look like a lot of productions are really starting to ramp up in 2021. So that talent, you know, may or may not be available because so many productions, I think everyone's kind of figured out, you know, like Kim described, has figured out what you need to do in order to be safe. And so people are really starting to, to ramp that up and talent is uh, are, are becoming you know, happy to, to jump on board projects if it's, uh, if it's the right situation. Yeah, and, and Tony, I remember we were talking. You were saying, you know, Florida or the, where you live is 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 open for business, as you say. Uh, people have been uh, walking around. Are you personally, you know, you're holed up there in your home office, but are you personally? Do you take meetings physically with a safe distance, or is it still mostly done over Zoom or phone calls? No, uh, to be honest with you, you know, like I said, Florida, the weather is great, so I've been going out and sitting in a lot of sidewalk cafes and having having meetings. I'm happy to get out of the office. So anybody in Florida that wants to meet, call me up. I'll uh, I'll come grab a coffee with you somewhere to say at a safe distance, you know, between the tables. So yeah, it's been it's been good. Things have uh, things have really picked up, and you know, everywhere is different. Florida is a little different from everywhere else in the United States. We're 100% open. There are no restrictions on restaurants, bars, time frames, anything like that. So, you know, in some people's opinions, that's dangerous. Other people's opinions, it's, uh, you know, they're happy that businesses are, are up and going. So I'm willing to get out of my, uh, my home office here and, 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 and meet up with people uh, safely, of course. Yeah, um, well, look, we're gonna have to wrap up in a few minutes, but very quickly, Brian, AFM 2020 online is starting next week, as we all know. Um, you've got, I imagine you've got lots to talk about in this, necessary evil way of uh, in, of doing business of course you, you're saying that with slightly with a tongue in cheek but um uh, Mimi, i'm sure the same's for you and um, look we wish you all the best with your with your projects uh, kim with your future endeavors um tony too with everything all the good work you're doing there in florida and um if any of you have any last minute observations uh, about um uh, the the months ahead and what your hopes are we're all ears um, otherwise, I think we're going to say goodbye and uh, thank you to everybody for their time and their questions. I just want to say thank you to Jeremy and Orlando for you know having me on board. It's great to be here with Tony and Mimi and Kim. You guys have you know are are a great representation of how creative people have adapted to a a rather uh, horrific and rapidly changing global situation. And you're, you're an inspiration to a lot of uh, the young filmmakers out there. And so it's just an honor to be on the panel with, uh, with all of you. So thank you. This yeah, thank you to everyone cool. for, for, please turn. I'm oh, sorry. I, I just wanted again, yeah, echo what Brian said. Thank all of you for being on the panel with me. I really appreciate it. And, and Kim, we haven't met in person, but I know Sun Don't Shine did shoot yeah. here in in uh in our area prior to me being film commissioner but uh yeah it was, you want to come. it was one of my favorite filming experiences there it's great <laughs> well uh, let, let's get you back to florida then okay <laughs> well, thanks tony thanks brian Thank thanks, you, everyone. thanks Kim, Thank for you. a ridiculously thanks. cordial session and we wish you all the best <laughs> And thank you to you at home for your questions uh, watching. And um, today's webinar will be available on screen daily tomorrow. And if you have any talking points you'd like us to discuss, please email your questions to matt.mueller at screendaily.com. Until then, thank you very much, everyone, and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, everyone. Bye.